This video is about my dad's final days. He's dead now, killed by cancer, a glioblastoma, and I'm sad, depressed, anxious, relieved, angry, guilty, probably all of these at once. Writing is how I process my emotions, so I'm laying out my thoughts here to help myself and maybe help others who are enduring similar tragedies. If you're curious about my dad's diagnosis and the time leading up to his final months at in-home hospice, I left a link in the description to that video. And fair warning, I'm gonna discuss some uncomfortable topics, the emotional and physical reality of caring for another human who's dying. These end-of-life discussions involve realities many don't enjoy contemplating, so I understand if it's too difficult to watch. Okay, let's dive in. Two days before my birthday, I visited my father in his hospital bed in the back of the house. He had already mostly lost his ability to speak because his tumor had eaten that part of his brain. My mom was already with him, and when I entered, he started pointing to the TV cabinet beside his bed with great urgency. Over the past weeks, this sort of pointing had become a tragic game of charades. I steeled myself for a guessing game in which we would attempt to decipher my father's wishes. Did he want Tylenol, something stronger, food? I followed his finger towards the cabinet and racked my brain for what might be inside the drawers. But my mom, who was usually worse at guessing, already knew exactly what he wanted. And she asked him, are you sure? And he nodded emphatically. So she pulled an iPhone out of the cabinet and handed it to me saying, happy birthday. I almost cried. You see, my dad is or was not the type to say I love you or to really express any emotion, at least not overtly, but he knew my phone's battery was only lasting a couple of hours and that I was too stubborn or cheap to do anything about it myself. As my mom later told me, despite the fact that his brain was only partially functioning and it might take him many minutes to type a single sentence on his iPad, he spent hours deciding which phone to buy and persuading her to actually buy it, checking afterwards, of course, that she'd gotten the right one. This was his version of I love you. He had exerted incredible effort in his last days to get me the phone. Of course, I couldn't give a crap about the phone itself, but the meaning behind the gift struck me in that moment. I hugged him, relishing the feel of his frail remaining working arm wrapping around my back. I choked in tears, not wanting to send him into an emotional fit himself, a regular occurrence those days and one that he didn't seem to enjoy. As I mentioned, this all happened two days before my birthday because he believed that two days from then, he would no longer have the mental capacity to enjoy giving me this final birthday present. And you know what? He was absolutely right. Just the next day, a seizure knocked him down to a state of even deeper mental anguish than he'd yet experienced. But let's rewind a little. In mid-October, my dad's oncologist told us that he had two to three months left to live. And a day later, he moved to inpatient hospice and returned two weeks later in late October after a somewhat miraculous recovery at the hospital. The first week he was home was a gift. He'd regained a remarkable ability to speak, and my mom and I spent a lot of time with him during those seven days. There wasn't really anything left unsaid, but we talked about this and that, just enjoying a period of relative normalcy after months of drug-induced stupor. A seizure at the end of the week robbed his ability to speak, though, and over the next month, he lost the capacity to utter even a single word. And caregiving, which was already complicated, became even more burdensome. At that point, it would have been easier to let him just lay in bed, but he clung to every one of his remaining abilities with understandable vigor. Getting to the bathroom was at the forefront of his mind because as it turns out, pooping in a diaper or a bedpan in your bed is not the most comfortable experience. I did my very best to honor his wishes, and for a week or so, I was able to manage, though 
not without injury to myself. It's funny how a few feet between a bed and a toilet can become an almost insurmountable obstacle. I had to basically lift him from bed into a wheelchair, wheel him into the bathroom, and shift him from the chair to the toilet. He loved sitting on that stupid toilet with its seat warmer and bidet function, but I feared it wouldn't be long before the trip became impossible. Unfortunately, the moment it did become impossible was also the one and only time he fell. You see, the entire right side of his body had very limited use because of the tumor's location. His arm hung from his shoulder like a limp rope, and his leg had very little strength. The problem that led to his fall was that his brain was still trying to send signals into these dysfunctional limbs. So one day, when he really wanted to use the bathroom, I got him into his chair like normal. But the second he was sitting, he basically threw himself headfirst onto the floor. It was only later that I came to understand how that happened after I saw him try to do it again the very next day. He was actually trying to straighten himself in the chair. He pushed up with his left arm, which was still very strong, and I noticed that he probably thought he was also pushing with his right hand. The uneven application of strength pushed him onto the floor. He bumped his head, thankfully so lightly that it didn't even leave a bruise, but the fall sent him into a weird stupor for a few minutes. While I lifted him back into the chair, we were both shaking, me from adrenaline and exertion, as it turns out. it's much harder to lift a person from the floor than from a bed, and him from pure shock, I think. He was almost catatonic, breathing in quick, sharp gasps. When I'd regained my wits, I got him back into bed, and a few minutes later, he'd recovered like nothing had even happened. When the hospice nurse arrived to examine him, they didn't find anything amiss. I'm not sure he even remembered the whole fiasco, but I certainly did, and still do. You know, added to the list of things I feel guilty about, I guess. Anyway, that was his last trip to the bathroom. Ever. And that's the striking thing about one's final days, especially with brain cancer in which the disease steals basic functions that we take for granted as adults. There's a lot of lasts, and we were all aware of them, including him. Just like there was a time he took his first steps, there was also a time he took his last. His first successful trip to the potty some 70 years ago was bookended by his final time on a real toilet. We did manage to get him onto a bedside commode for a few more days, but then even that became impossible after the little remaining use of his right side vanished. He would remain in bed for the rest of his life. This was one of the things that made him most sad. When he got home from hospice, he declared he wanted to rebuild enough strength to walk to the bathroom. Now, I didn't think it likely, but I only said that I hoped he would. He also suggested he might even make it to the dining room for one final Thanksgiving, which was in three weeks from then. None of that would happen, and after a seizure, he realized it too. And he said, I'm never leaving this room again. He cried and sobbed at this impossible, terrible, depressing epiphany, but as usual, my dad was right. He was in tune with his body and symptoms. In fact, his internal deterioration really became his sole focus as he lay in a sort of artificial twilight in the back of the house. Soon, nothing would interest him aside from the strange sensations in his bad arm or the drool that escaped the right side of his drooping mouth. I want to pause here and talk a little bit about professional caregiving. There are a lot of people out there who do this for a living. Individuals not employed by the hospice system, but known by hospice workers. People families can hire privately to care for their loved ones if they can afford it. This is a weird dynamic. You're inviting a stranger into your home to take intimate care of a loved one during their dying days. And the repercussions of a bad hire can be disastrous. Now, we didn't experience any disasters, but the first woman we hired was not a good fit. A lot of the job was just watching my dad for seizures, then caring for him when he needed something done. In other words, 
there was a lot of downtime. This caregiver didn't like that because she always wanted to be active. She also needed a lot of management, handholding, praise, support. At a time in which we were already overwhelmed, we just didn't have the emotional capacity to worry about yet another person in our lives. At the same time, we were afraid to fire her because we feared how difficult it might be getting someone else. The problem sort of took care of itself, though, because one day she came in pretty sick, coughing, sneezing, exhausted. We asked if she wasn't feeling well, but she assured us it was just fall or you know, autumn allergies. But as the day wore on, she got worse and worse, and the last thing I wanted was for my dad to catch a respiratory infection. And eventually, she decided to leave early, and we called and asked her not to come in if she wasn't feeling well, and she basically told us, though not in such direct words, that she didn't want the job anymore. And thank goodness the guy we hired next was absolutely wonderful. Caring, compassionate, attentive, patient, really anything you could ask for in a caregiver. If I have any advice in this area, it's to listen to your gut. If you feel like someone isn't a good fit, it's better to end the relationship sooner because every bit of added stress just wears you down that much more. Even with the extra help though, there was still a lot of time we didn't have help. Early mornings, nights, weekends, and really caring for a person in such a compromised state isn't easy. I did all kinds of things to and for my dad that I never fathomed I'd do. I cleaned and replaced the condom catheter on his penis. I stuck suppositories up his butt when he was constipated. I washed him turned him, put lotion on his skin, and a whole lot more. Most awful, though, was the medicine. As his condition worsened, finding ways to get his essential seizure medicines in became more and more difficult. At first, he could swallow them in pill form, then we were able to crush the pills into pudding, then he took them in liquid form, and when he started choking on the liquid, we thickened it with powder. When he lost the ability to bring the cup to his mouth, I would cradle his head in my arms and tip the viscous fluid past his parched lips. Finally, I used a syringe to give him small sips of medicine. He would purse his lips like a baby sucking on a bottle and swish the medicine in his mouth before swallowing with great difficulty. I felt awful in a weird way, like I was poisoning him. He didn't want this disgusting medicine, but seizures would make his existence even more miserable, so I had to make sure that he got a therapeutic dose. And thankfully, he seemed to understand and would make great effort to take the meds, more effort than he exerted towards anything else at that point. When even the liquid syringe failed, we could no longer give him his normal doses, and we switched solely to Ativan, which can be administered in much lesser volumes that he would not need to swallow. A little bit of fluid nestled against his gums would absorb and enter his bloodstream. And through all this, he maintained some level of awareness. It was impossible to say whether he knew what was going on, but I think he did, almost up to his last couple of days. Really, up until his final two weeks, he was still using his iPad to watch old episodes of The X-Files and sometimes to read the news. He ate fish sticks or pieces of melon or cookies and drank water. Only towards the end did he no longer want food, and only during the last few days did his desire for fluid also wane. And throughout this period, a weird sort of disconnect formed in my brain. There was the person my dad once was, then there was this diminished version of him that almost felt like a stranger. Actually, I think I wanted him to feel like a stranger. I built a gulf between my emotions and my day-to-day -day caregiving duties because I don't think I could have pushed through otherwise. How could I reconcile the act of digging poop from my dad's butt with the supremely capable and independent man he was just a few months prior? I couldn't. I dehumanized him. He was like an object, a machine. I serviced rather than my father. I'm not sure that was a healthy attitude on my part, but it did get me through those impossible few months and staved off what would have otherwise been a complete mental breakdown. I've heard that lots of dying patients have a final burst of energy hours or a day before death. 
They'll wake up and laugh and talk and enjoy their family one last time. And my dad certainly had a surge of energy, but all of it was directed into uncontrollable hiccups. For about three days before his final stretch, he could not stop hiccuping. We tried every kind of medicine because these hiccups were so powerful, they'd shake his entire body. It was torturous for us and possibly for him as well. When the hiccups were over though, he never really woke up again besides a single moment near midnight when he reached out and squeezed my hand, our final interaction. Neither my mom nor I were in the room the moment he passed, though we were there moments later. He still looked alive. His temperature was normal and his cheeks had color, but he had just passed. Over the next five hours, we waited for the hospice to certify his death and then for the funeral home to collect his body. I looked in on him a few times over those long hours and each time he looked less and less alive. By the time his covered body left our home for the final time, he looked a lot like the corpses depicted on TV shows and movies. I am a visual person with a terrible memory for language or names, but an excellent memory for images, and I will never forget the last look on his face. It was so much more peaceful than the grimaces and contortions of his dying months. His passing had been about as peaceful as I can imagine. He was asleep during the transition. There was no death rattle. His breathing and heart rate just got more and more rapid until they both stopped. As I sit here thinking though, I'm not dwelling on his moment of death. My mind is drawn to the last meaningful idea my dad managed to communicate to me. He had no words at that point, none at all, but his brain was still working enough to allow complex emotions. He was depressed in a deep and horrific way I hope to never personally experience, but I could tell that that wasn't what he was trying to communicate. I looked at him and somehow, based on his expression, pleading eyes, and body language, I understood. I said, perhaps selfishly, are you trying to thank me for being such a good son? He nodded so emphatically that his chin dug into his collarbone and he grabbed my hand and burst into tears. He couldn't speak, but he was trying to express his gratitude, not just for the time I spent caring for him in recent months, but for a lifetime of experiences we shared. Now that he's dead, there's an astronomical number of things to do. As I watched his coffin descend into its grave, I couldn't help but imagine all the material possessions he'd left behind. He was a bit of a hoarder and never threw things away. Cleaning up his various messes will take months or years. Just today, I was cleaning up a table in the basement and it was like layers of an archeological dig. About midway down the pile, I excavated a business card dating back to the 1970s. And next to it was some sort of dusty gadget. I think it was a voltage meter for testing electrical outlets, but as I spun it in my hands, the only thought I had was, oh, I'll ask my dad what this is and if he wants to keep it. Thanks so much for watching. I'm a writer and you can find my website in the description if you're interested. Consider subscribing here as I share more about my books, an animation I'm working on, thoughts on grieving, and lots more. I can't promise you'll enjoy every video, but hopefully enough of them to make subscribing worthwhile. Thanks again, and I'll see you again soon.